Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, new talk uh, organized by the Aberdeen Italian Circle. I'm absolutely delighted to have Jill Harrison um, presenting for us this evening. Please let me introduce her to you. Uh, Jill is a graduate from the Open University where uh, she gained a first class uh, a BA with honors degree and then an MPhil from the University of Newcastle. She is currently a research associate and uh, an associate lecturer, lecturer and a consultant. Jill uh, Harrison joined the Open University as an associate lecturer in 1996, and she taught art history at all levels. Um, she also um, held the lecturer post in the Department of History of Art until 2015. And during this time, she chaired the Art History MA. She was co-chair of the Renaissance Reconsidered module and deputy chair of the new art history MA. She contributed to art and visual culture from 1100 to 1600 and to the new art history MA modules. She continues to lecture extensively. And amongst her latest publications, I would just like to mention two. One is uh, Fresh Perspectives on Hugo van der Goes portrait of Margaret of Denmark and the Trinity altarpiece that is uh, uh, published in, the, in an academic journal called the Court Historian. And the second one is a chapter entitled Partisan Politics, Giotto's Oni Santi Madonna, Making Invisible Allegiances Visible. And uh, this uh, uh, chapter is, is part of this volume that is entitled Art and Experience in Trecento Italy, published by Brepols. And you can find it on the website of Brepol Publishers, but also on Amazon if you wish to buy it. <laughs> so uh, welcome, Jill. <laughs> so as everyone know, you are going to present on art and identity, textiles and trade in Trecento Siena. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Sandra. And I was delighted to welcome everybody and good evening. And I was delighted when Sandra invited me to come and talk to you this evening because I always grasp any opportunity to talk about the Trecento. I think for me, the early Renaissance is very much as interesting, if not even more than what we consider the standard Renaissance. And I think it's quite right that we challenge the concept of the Renaissance because there is a tendency to think that it began very much in the 15th and 16th century. But really for me, it is the Trecento that is hugely exciting. This is the time when radical ideas began very much in terms of interest in art, in natural science, in travel, um, you get the beginnings of, of perspective. Um, and it, it really is the time when um, things started to move and there was huge ambition within society. Now I'm very much, um, I would call myself a social art historian. And when I look at works of art, I want to know who made them, who they were for, what's the point of them, what's the history, the society, the politics that is behind them. Um, and Michael Baxendall, who I'm sure you may have heard of, who is a wonderful cultural and social art historian, considers the sorts of works that we're looking at this evening. And he talks about them as being rich cultural repositories and that we can learn a great deal from them. And he talks about a very interesting theory called the period eye, which means that we should try and put ourselves in the place, in this case, of the Trecento society that produced this particular art and to try and immerse ourselves in their society and their context and see the works as they would and understand what they meant for them. It's always a case of follow the money with art and that was very true in the Trecento. Um, the Renaissance was driven by wealth if we 
there wasn't trade, if there wasn't um, money and thriving business and stable society, then there certainly wouldn't be um, the wherewithal to commission these works of art. So it, as today, it depends very much on how successful a society is as to whether it can, um, whether it can support art and commission art. And the trade center very much is a time when art changed from the church, which dominated, to a whole new sort of patron. So I'm just going to share my screen with you so that we can start looking at some, some works. There, I think you should all be able to see that now. Yes, that's um, perfect, Jill. Is that okay? You've got it there, good. Um, so in the Trecento, a new and increasingly powerful category of per patron emerged. And that's what really made the difference. Um, from the church being dominant, we think about the merchant classes. And this was based very much on the success of textiles and trade. Um, merchants, the middle classes who became rich through this um, were trading in the East and along the Silk Road. And I think perhaps we don't realize the extent of trade and travel at this particular period, but it was extensive. And you'll see that from some of the slides that I'm going to show you in a moment. Um, so the people of the Trade Center, they now wanted art that represented them. Before it had been um, strictly devotional art, but now there was this really quite fundamental shift where if patrons, merchants were paying for works, they wanted works which showed the everyday life. They wanted to be part of the art themselves, which was why portraits particularly started um, coming into works of art at this particular time. And there was a, a gradual shift away from sacred towards the secular. And this was also very much an age of civic pride and identity. And Sienna subscribed to this very effectively. So today we're going to look at the art at, of Sienna, who embraced this shift, and we'll look in particular at a wonderful range of art and architecture, which demonstrates for me how fascinating and how subtle and complex the meanings could be. And Sienna, I think, is often sidelined by Florence, which was considered for a long time as a more important artistic centre. Um, but I challenge that, and I think very much, especially in the Trecento, that Sienese art was equally innovative and even more colourful and decorative. And you can often um, recognise Sienese art and artists because of their love of pattern and design and beauty. So in particular, we'll be looking at works that relate to the textile trades, wool and silk, um, the former, which was a local industry, and the latter was a signifier very much for Siena's ambitious trade links with the wider world. And both of these trades were central very much to the city's civic pride and identity. Now, I'm sure a lot of you will have been to Siena, and when you see the the images, you'll recognize it straight away. To understand Siena, you've really got to understand the topography, I think, um, and some of the things about the city and what made it tick at that particular time. Um, it lies on this three-pointed ridge. It's about 50 miles from its great rival, Florence. Uh, it had a population of about 20,000 compared to 90,000 um, in Florence. But sadly, um, Siena, which is the home to the Palio, which hasn't happened for about two years, um, has been missing out on its tourist industry. And it is very much a honeypot. I'm sure if you've been to Siena um, in the summer, you'll know how absolutely packed it is. But if it's possible for you to stay overnight, there aren't many places to stay in, in the centre. But if you do, then it becomes a completely different city. Um, in the evenings, it's, it's completely different and early in the morning, or if you can go in the winter, it's a wonderful time to visit it. 
one of the things that was important, particularly for Siena as well, was that it was on this very significant route called the Via Francigena, um, which traveled the full length of Italy there. And you can see that it was a pilgrimage route um, starting with Rome, it went right the way through to Canterbury and on to Jerusalem in the other direction. And there was a constant stream of pilgrims on this particular route. And it was an excellent trading route too. And Siena was right in the middle of it, you can see there. So that brought people to Siena all the time. It brought pilgrims, um, it brought trade, um, and it brought industry and wealth to the city. But one thing that Siena didn't have at that particular time was water, particularly, because of its geographical situation on the top of a hill. It meant that that was a very different um, setup to Florence, which was on the river Arno, and that immediately affected the textile industry because of the massive um, wool industry in Florence, which relied on all the water that was readily available from the Arno. And if you were there in the, in the early Renaissance, right through the Renaissance, all lining the river would be workshops where wool was, was dyed and washed and fulled and hung out on, on racks all the way on both sides of the river. So it had an adequate supply of water, but what Siena didn't have um, was this plentiful water, which was really critical. So they built these fabulous underground aqueducts, the Bottini, and you can see from this slide how wonderfully they were engineered and they go right beneath the city and they are still in, in this glorious state that you can see today and you can see the sort of technology and engineering that's gone into making these so, um, so enduring. And these were connected to troughs and wells throughout the city. So water was really precious. And water is celebrated in Siena. There are, there are little wells and fountains all over. And I just put this one in because it's, it's certainly an example of how Siena celebrated um, its precious water. And this is the fountain by Jacopo della Quercia, about 1419, um, which if you've been there, you know that it, it um, takes up a, a larger prominent space in the Campo. It's a, a beautiful sight on a hot day when you have the fountain there. Um, this isn't the original, the original has been removed. This is a copy, but it tells you an awful lot about Siena, how she felt about herself about her, her civic pride. And the iconography of this fountain is particularly interesting, um, that it's classical. It shows how Sienna felt herself to be sophisticated, to have an interest in classical values, and also because of the Roman foundation myth of Sienna, which was based on the idea of Rea Silvia and Acca Laurentia, which you can't see now, they were big figures, um, female figures, classical figures, who were perched at each end, standing, freestanding figures, and you can still see them in the, in the museum today. But they were the mother and foster mother of Romulus and Remus. Um, and the Siena myth said that Siena was founded by Senius, who was the son of Remus. And Romulus and Remus were at some time in their babyhood, um, suckled by the she-wolf. And this figure features prominently in the iconography of the city and in paintings and sculptures. So the wool trade was central to Siena's success. And some of these little images particularly show how important they were. These are what were called the Bicerna, which were the financial registers of the city. And they had wonderful covers, beautif beautifully colored and painted covers. On the left-hand side there, they've got the black and white colors of um, the civic emblems of Siena. But on the right-hand side, an important one shows, relates to the, to the wool guild, 
there is a member of the Royal Guild who is the patron, the donor on the left hand side with the white robe. And then you have St Nicholas on the right and you have a personification of Siena. So all around the, the city, you will see these, um, these emblems to do with, with the wool trade. And it was hugely powerful in civic and political life. It organized processions and feasts. They commissioned altarpieces and they kept a very high public profile. And there was huge rivalry always between Siena and Florence. Um, between the wool guilds as well. And if you've been to Florence, you may know the wonderful Arte della Lana, which is in the, the heart of the guild district, just as you approach the Piazza della Signoria and all the lovely guild buildings are there. To the left here, you can't see it, but there's Or San Michele, what was the grain market. And here we're looking at the very prestigious Arte della Lana building, which is currently the home of um, the Societa Dantesca, um, which thrives obviously in Florence. But what many people don't know so much is that there is a fabulous um, audience chamber there that is not open to the public, sadly, because it has what I consider one of the best Trecento um, extant fresco schemes in the city. It's a sort of a, a jotesque scheme. Um, and I mention it because it gives you an idea of the huge prestige of, um, of the textile industries at, the particular, at that particular time. And it's all about status and propaganda. And the frescoes here, they deal with justice and good behavior. And in many ways, they're very similar to the good and bad government um, frescoes in the Palazzo Pubblico in Siena, which many of you will seen, have seen. And I believe that these particular scenes um, possibly influenced the good and bad government. Um, so when we look here at Florence, at Siena, you can see very much what a, a beautiful building it is. Um, and also the importance of civic pride. And what is striking still is the unity, the architectural unity of this campo, which dates from the Trecento. And you can see very much that the materials and the colors were particularly carefully chosen um, because beauty was so important. And the idea of, of space is hugely important too. Um, space represents money. And the fact that they have this huge clear area demonstrates very much how important um, having their buildings aesthetically appreciated. Because if they'd had shops and um, all the way around, then they wouldn't have had this wonderful space to be able to see the extent of the architecture and it's a ceremonial space as well. So like the Piazza Signoria in, in Florence um, where the government knocked down lots of houses specifically so that they could create this prestigious space, this happens exactly the same in Siena. So you're beginning to get a sense of how important civic pride and civic identity was to the city. Um, and being Sienese was very much something to celebrate. People were proud to, to be Sienese. Um, and this is all about sort of civility and sophistication. And these are the messages that were put across in the wonderful um, good and bad government frescoes in the, in the Palazzo Publico, which is the building that you can see at the left with that fantastic tower. And this, idea of rivalry is very, very strong. And I mention it because it is relevant to the trades um, because there was the rivalry always between um, Florence and Siena in terms of the sort of materials that were being produced. 
And there's a wonderful word here, um, campanilismo, which is more or less, my bell tower is larger than yours. And it was, a, again, a sign of huge rivalry. And the towers stood and propagandized for the power of the communes. And we can see here that the wonderful example of the bell tower of the Palazzo Publico, and then similarly in the Piazza Signoria in Florence. And above you have the towers of nearby San Gimignano, not far away from Vienna. And this is a lovely um, image, a very early image of Siena before what were called the magnatial towers were clipped. And these were the magnatial families, the very important magnates, the business people, the, the merchants, and some nobility who built these huge towers um, as a sign of their individual power. But the governments felt that they were getting rather beyond themselves and insisted that the level of the towers, that they were taken down, that they were clipped. To, um, to keep the various people in line. And that was, that was done shortly in the, in the Trecento. So here we have a scene that you've probably seen frequently, which is the personification of good government of Ben Comune, which is from the Good Government War in the Palazzo Publico. And it has the two, um, the Romulus and Remus, the Senius and Asius, the sons of, Rom of Remus, at the feet of Ben Comune. And you can see the wolf there, which is part of good government. And it was hugely important that society was stable. And so justice is at the heart of everything um, in order to um, make society prosper. And here again, we have the wonderful um, image of the good city, which is all about trade. And it's fascinating if you ever get the opportunity to get really up close here to look at what's being sold on the various stalls. Certainly there are textiles, there are shoes, there are um, children being taught, but there's a very, very interesting detail right in the middle of this work that is often overlooked, and it's this. And these are Mongol horsemen in the background, just casually riding through the town. And we know that they're Mongol by their, their hats, um, and you'll see a number of um, works of art by Sienese artists who bring this motif in. So it's fascinating to think that there were, um, the elements of trade and travel were part of everyday life there, that Siena was not necessarily cut off from the wider world or parochial particularly, but that there was this wonderful sense of trade and coming and going, that it was vibrant. Um, and the Mongol horsemen particularly represent the silk trade and the silk route. And it always amazes me uh, one of the modules that I teach at the moment is called Art and Its Global Histories. And it shows the extent of trade in Italy at this time. And um, it, was, it was flourishing. In 1300, for example, at the, um, the Jubilee of Pope Boniface in Rome, there was a delegation of 100 Mongols, uh, Mongolians, from um, the court of the Khan, who was sent there as a trade mission, as well as um, to network with the Italians. And ambassadors from all the cities in Italy were um, instructed to go and make their own connections with, um, with the Mongolian delegation. And I think to think of that in, in 1300 in Rome adds, adds a huge sense of excitement and if you start looking very carefully in images of this period, 
you will frequently see in sacred art and secular art wonderful um, depictions of tartar silk which was coming in at that particular time and artists desperately wanted to paint it because it was it was so beautiful and patrons wanted to include it in their works to show their own wealth um, and sophistication. And here again, you can see Mongolians in this particular um, image by Ambrogio Lorenzetti of 1336. You can see the, the Tartar hats and the, and, um, the mustaches and the, the other wonderful headdresses. And this is from the martyrdom of the Franciscans um, and it's in San Francesco in Assisi. But it shows that um, Sienese artists and indeed Sienese um, people were engaging with the wider world to quite an extent, even at this time. And that textiles was a central part of, their, of this connection, this very um, symbiotic relationship with other places. And the civic pride continues through the city. And I put this in for the architectural purposes as well to show um, how beautiful the, the Duomo was, the black and white, the Balsana, the um, black and white civic colors are there throughout the city. But also this idea of um, the Via Francigena that I mentioned before and the pilgrimage hospital, the Santa Maria della Scala, which you can see immediately behind the Duomo. Um, and this is all to do with trade again, and hospitality and charity. And Sienna wanting to show that she was a sophisticated um, center where pilgrims and travelers um, were always welcome. And this is a wonderful church and hospital there. Um, and Siena, as you know, is known as the city of the Virgin. The Virgin um, was considered the protector and intercessor um, whom they prayed to in times of war and famine and plague. And inside, again, put these in to show you, which many of you may have already seen, this wonderful slightly later um, and very, very beautiful, very, very vivid set of frescoes by Vecchietta, um, which is, they're quite spectacular. And they're all to do with the life of, of the Pellegrinaio, of, of um, the pilgrimage hospital. And they detail what is going on, the people who were, who were, um, who were treated there. Um, but also the figures on the left and the right are part of some of the scenes. And you can see the fabulous textiles and what they sort of represent. These are the silks that I've been talking about. There is the Pope on the left um, with this glorious silk, probably a tartar silk um, with silver thread through it. And again, you can see um, the same sort of patterns and designs, either cut velvet or silk again um, in the costume on the right. So costume, learning to read costumes and thinking, um, going much, much further to think about what the textiles that you see in the costumes might represent in terms of trade, of networking, um, of self-fashioning. The Trecento is a time when self-fashioning comes very much to the fore and the images of um, the people who were represented become more and more important and their clothing, um, whether it be silks, wools, furs, um, jewelry, becomes a, a huge statement about their pride and, and confidence in themselves, but also in their city. So it's a signifier. Textiles become a massive signifier in this period for all sorts of um, really important concepts to do with the city and with the, with the individual. But what I'd like to do is to look at this and to ask you perhaps, 
to look at this work for a minute, if it's possible, if, if Sandra can arrange this or anybody who would like to, to have a look at this particular work because for the, for the rest of the session, I want to look at specific examples of works of art that um, deal with the wool trade and um, the silk trade particularly, and to get you to have a look at them and perhaps try to read them and to think about them in some of the terms that I've been talking about, civic identity, pride, um, the sorts of um, materials that might be produced in Siena, and, and to see how they fit in with the iconography of a particular work. And when you're looking at a work of art like this, you want to start with what hits you in the face first, because that's what the artist really wanted you to see. So if anybody would like to um, either type in the chat box or say um, what it is that strikes you particularly when you look at this work of art, what is it that you think your eye is being drawn to and why particularly what do you think it might be representing? If anybody would like to, um, to say. Then. Yes, absolutely. If, uh, if you, anyone want to uh, say something, please feel free to unmute yourselves, click on the microphone icon on the bottom left corner of your screen and you can just speak to interact with Jill. Or if you prefer, indeed, you can write something in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Yes, but equally, equally, if not, that's fine. But if you would, it would be lovely. I would love to hear what people think and what, how yes. you respond to this work. There is someone who wrote something in the chat. It says the bed covering is immediately impactive. It, it's John who is saying that. that Yes, indeed, the, the bed cover is quite, uh, takes pride of place. Yes, it, it does. Is there anything else that anybody finds interesting, particularly if you're, if you're sort of looking? We'll, we'll I, think the the I, think, I think the colour. I think the colour. That red, the red, and the, um, the Middle Eastern feel about the top of the, the blue and the colours. I think it's the red. Brilliant. Hugely important and always symbolic of all sorts of different things. It, it isn't just red, it takes on all sorts of different meanings. Yeah, it's, it's very Middle Eastern at the top. Brilliant. What, what else? Is there anything else that you're intrigued by? Can that I, you? I'd like to say uh, one thing that, I can, that struck me in the last picture that was in the Santa Maria de la Scala was the perspective. And mm. it's probably not quite what you wanted, but it's the perspective. And that comes through with the the textiles, you can actually see the textiles because of the the, the perspective, the, the use of perspective, the going of the roofing, the background, the bedding, and it all depth gives you it's all depth. Yeah, that well, you've, you've I'll come back to all those three things because those are the <laughs> you are absolutely right, those are the three things that I would go for as well that I think hit you in the face straight away. Would anybody like to? The, 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 other <laughs> the other colour that strikes you is is the purple. And purple, I think, was a symbol of wealth, wasn't it, at, at that time? Mm -hmm. So the reclining lady in the middle has got a very long purple robe and also gold headdress, which Brilliant. would be a symbol yes. of wealth, I presume. Yeah, well, I sh I'll explain who everybody is in, in a minute. Um, but these are exactly the, the sorts of things that, you know, you want to be looking at when you look at an image like this that you really want to be thinking about, that you ask yourself questions, you know, why, why is she, why is she as large as that, for one thing, because she is very much, she is bigger, you know, she, she has um, heft, she's monumental, the figure lying on the bed. Do you, have you any idea what's going on here, or who they, who any of these figures might be? She's the mother Mary. She's the mother of Mary, yes. Yeah. So this is this is the birth of the Virgin. So it's St. Anne that you're seeing reclining in a very sort of nonchalant way on, on the bed there, despite the fact that she's just given that she's give, given birth. You have to remember that art is hugely idealized. Um, so is there anything else that that strikes you of interest? Yes, I mean, there are a couple of uh, attendees, Isabel, that mentions the curtains, the draperies and 
Shannon who says possibly Perugia towels on the right and then yes. birth of the Virgin. Yes. Yeah, all of those things, but I'll I'll go through the things that you've mentioned. Um, isn't, isn't the other thing that it's almost like a stage set that you've got um, the, the two right hand, the central and the right hand one are a continuous picture with a column breaking it up, but the two men and the sitting on the left are like in a corridor by the side and you're almost like you see sometimes on a television program where the set isn't complete because you're able to see what's going on to the side. It, yes, it, 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 exactly that. It's a sort of a, it is a sort of a construct. It's a drama. It's a narrative. And that's what's really interesting in the Trecento because you're moving on from the sort of Byzantine static icons which were very flat because they were wholly devotional and then you look at a work like this which is very much what I was saying before this is when people wanted their works to represent their everyday life and here we have St Anne who is giving birth in a very upmarket Sienese bedroom this is all about the affluence of, of Siena it's yeah, showing very much um, Never all the it. things that people would aspire to yeah. at that particular yeah. time. And you're exactly right about the way that it, it's been broken up. It's in three. So you also think what might be the sort of significance of that. And if there's something is in a three, it's usually to do with the Trinity. And it's divided horizontally oh, yeah. as well, because you have a sort of a heavenly sphere at the top, and then you have an earthly sphere. And the people who looked at that would be able to identify with it because it was part of what was happening in their everyday life and they would want to be part of that event so you're starting to get sacred works of art but are very much of the everyday and it's always struck me on the left that um this is Joachim on the on the left and he it's like a labor ward where the men have been shunted off to the side and they are waiting to hear the results of this fantastic birth, this, the birth of the Virgin. And the little boy is whispering in the father's ear that you have a daughter. And so it's, it's very immediate and it's very natural. And this is when naturalism comes in, in this particular period. And as um, you mentioned, perspective as well. This is not just rudimentary perspective, this is really quite sophisticated, and this is in the 1300s. And St Anne is on the bed. The people who saw that would recognize it pretty much straight away as an image that had been taken from um, a tomb, from a sarcophagus. She's very much um, in the style of a Roman matron on a sarcophagus. And this is um, Lorenzetti showing that he understands classical values, that he may have traveled, that he had seen classical um, monuments. And here he is reproducing it. This monumental figure comes straight from sculpture. She is sculptural. When you look at her, she's very solid. She's very sculptural um, and she dominates the scene. But what does dominate, as somebody very rightly said, is that fabulous Czech played the, that wonderful piece of cloth. And that is serving all sorts of different purposes. And what it's doing is advertising something that was made in Siena. It's a, a flagship work for the wool trade because at that particular time, Siena, because of the lack of water that I mentioned before, could only produce small amounts of very, very high quality cloth and it was very distinctive and it was often checked. And in some of the works that we'll look at in a minute, you can recognize, I've never seen it anywhere else, um, that Sienese artists at this particular time were representing these different cloths, the Czech plates in their works of art. Um, and it's a sign of Sienese identity. And it also shows how very clever the artist was because he's used it to show that he can create very sophisticated perspective. So it has all sorts of things to do with Siena, um, but how wonderful to have something like that that is advertising the wool trade in the midst of a very, very sacred um, work. And the 
women who are bringing food to the new mother have got what is called Sienese drawn thread work. Those um, what look like towels and cloths um, are black and white. And it was another textile, um, a craft that was very Sienese. And you'll see that again, if you're looking at Sienese works of art, you, you'll see that. Um, so you, you can see how a work like this propagandizes for all sorts of different things. And this is the, the sort of image that people were, were really wanting at this time. This is a desco de Pato, which is a birth tray, which was often given uh, with food to a new mother, exactly as we've just seen in the, in, um, in the birth of the Virgin. And it's a very secular scene, it's unusual. Um, and this is happening. This is just to show, this was a, a fantastic reconstruction of uh, a polyptic that was commissioned by the Wool Guild in Siena. And it shows the extent of, of their ambition and their importance that they were able to commission these huge works. And because time's moving on, we are going to just look at some examples of these wonderful pattern and design that is so typically Sienese. Um, and this is called The Dream of Sorbach. It's another work that was for um, a wool guild commission. And again, you can notice that wonderful checked cloth, which is really, um, really striking. And also the floor pattern um, is hugely important. Um, in Siena at that particular time, there was something called the Spend Thrift Brigade, La Consuma, um, and they were a group of young Sienese who spent 200,000 golden florins on high living and luxury. So Siena were, were really a, a society who knew how to live well. Um, they were prosperous, they were powerful, um, and a lot of the, um, their wherewithal derived from the silk that they bought, the silk that they traded, um, and the wonderful wool that they produced at that time. And these are all um, propagandizing for, for that. And this is a very unusual one because this is in the Palazzo del Popolo in, in San Gimignano. And it's purely secular. It's a quite sort of risque story um, in, the, in the town hall. But again, this is Memo di Filippuccio, um, who was related to Simone Martini. And um, again, the artist is using it in order to show perspective, but it's also advertising the wool trade. And again, this is a fabulous work of art, the Blessed Agostino Novello. Um, and you can notice in the, in the bottom right there um, that there is a scene that's got another um, checked played. And this again is propaganda. This is the Blessed Agostino Novello who is recruiting to the Agostinian order through his miracles. And it, this is called a continuous narrative. Um, there is something terrible happening in every little scene. And Agostino is flying in on a wing and a prayer and, um, and saving um, those in, in trouble. But this is like Siena. So the people would be a, who are seeing this would feel that this was very much part of their lives. These are the sorts of accidents that could happen, a child being um, bitten by a dog, child falling out of a window. They seem to have very um, accident prone children in this work. Um, they have a merchant in the top right and then in the bottom um, is particularly interesting because you have a child who is falling out of, out of bed and has been rescued. And you can see the, the mother in the scarlet who is carrying a little figure dressed in black and that is a potential recruit, a child recruit. The, the child who has been saved from falling out of its bed is going to become part of the Agostinian order. So this is a recruiting poster almost for, um, for the Agostinians. 
So it shows how art um, very much works on all sorts of different levels and for different purposes. And even if it's a religious work of art, it can have all sorts of secular, complex, social, political uh, meanings within it. And here again, you can see the details of this, of this wonderful plate. So I want to leave time for some questions. So I couldn't resist putting these details in here um, because they're so graphic and um, so well observed and the perspective is so very good and people would identify. And silk, again, as we've discussed, um, the depictions of silk used as cloths of honor, for example, in this wonderful um, Induccio's Maya star. Um, And this is another wonderful work. This is the Annunciation, another of the Marian altarpieces like the birth of the Virgin for the Duomo, which is what we saw before. And you can see the angel Gabriel there with his wonderful um, plaid, but it's a miraculous plaid. And I think the way that it's depicted is just superb because it's very heavy. The cloth is heavy, but it's made to float in the air through the upbeat of his wings. And you can, you can see it here, you can see the detail, you can see the wonderful silk that Gabriel is, is wearing, but you can also see the detail on this sort of silky woolen plaid, but it's whisked up into the air, a sense of lightness and, and miraculous um, that adds to the sense of miracle of the particular event. So they're using this, something that they would have in their everyday life, but they're introducing it into a, into a miracle uh, and making it very, very special. This is just to go back to trade again. This is in the good government and on the little stall, and I was explaining before about the stalls, you can see on the left there that there is there are Chinese ceramics, Chinese porcelain that are being sold in the middle. Um, which is, you know, it's a tiny detail, but it's so important. Um, there's a celadon vase, there's a little blue and white, like a ginger jar being sold on the, on the store. And this all shows the sophistication and the affluence of Siena to the people who were looking at it. And finally, just a few pictures of silks. Again, this is from San Francesco by another, um, Simone Martini, The Dream of St. Martin using perspective again, um, again, you can see the wonderful checked, checked clothing. Um, and it's almost like a signature for Sienese artists at this particular time. So they're representing very much um, the textile trade of their city, but they're also um, showing their own identity and their own ability to depict. And again, this final one, that has um, another plate at the bottom, but it also has a very interesting um, little figure here. And the lovely figure at the top right with the blue hat is the artist. And I'll finish with this, with the self-portrait of Simone Martini. And it's very unusual for an artist to incorporate um, a portrait. And I think this is an absolutely delightful one. He's, he's looking with real sort of, of, of longing and amazement and thinking about the miracle that, that's just happened. He looks moved by it. Um, and this is the time when the status of the artist changed as well and artists became individual and recognized for their style. And that changed the whole pattern of patronage um, and brought about the sort of cult of the, the artist that we know from the great artists like um, Leonardo da Vinci and, and Michelangelo, but it, I believe it, it started very much in, in Siena um, and was all tied up with the world trade. So thank you. I have kept you for a long time there, but I'm very happy for, for questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jill. This is uh, for this fantastic uh, overview of uh, Sienis paintings and the representations of Sienis material culture. If you want to stop sharing your screen so that we can focus on, on you again. And in the meantime, of course, 
um, anyone who want to contribute with a, a comment or ask a question to Jill, please feel free. Please note that I mute everyone again after, <laughs> after the, the little um, uh, conversation we had in the middle of the presentation uh, so that uh, uh, there weren't the background noises uh, uh, interrupting. So uh, if you want to speak, please just feel free to unmute yourselves again and, and ask a question to, to Jill. But uh, in the meantime, while we are waiting for, for people to, to ask something. I ju just wanted to say, it is indeed amazing, this representation of everyday life. And uh, Simone Martini particularly, he used these new techniques of this graffito and uh, you know, the, the glazing of a metal leaf uh, to represent the different textures of, of um, textiles. Yes, and that, that was new. You know, to do it in that particular way was very, very radical and showed the skill and the, the change in status of the artist comes about at this time. Yeah. Well, I, um, I, I just noticed the blue of Mary's robes, that really intense blue that would be lapis lazuli at this time which was the most expensive colour after gold. So that again is showing the wealth of um, the people who'd commissioned that painting. Very much, yes. When we're talking about the colour of the vermilion in the, in the birth of the Virgin, things like that pigments massively important. It's, it's, it does speak about the wealth and the sophistication and the trade as well, because these were all being imported. A lot mm -hmm. of these wonderful things are coming from from all over the east. So when when you start working out and and the purple that somebody rightly um, mentioned before, very very um, expensive and quite rare to get purple robes, and that was a sign of distinction as well. So that the language of color works on all sorts of different levels. So yes, that's a really good point, and the, and the blue, the depth of blue is is quite startling. Mm -hmm. Yes. Indeed, the Middle Ages weren't so dark after all. No, <laughs> not at all. And it, it is amazing, quite rightly, you showed the Via Francigena and, uh, you know, the kind of exchanges of all types that went through that city. You know, it was the golden era of Sienese culture, the Trecento. So that was, uh, that was, uh, the route that puts uh, the city in communication with the rest of the world. Literally. Yes, it wasn't parochial at all. We often tend to think of these little cities being very parochial, mm -hmm. but they weren't, not at all. Yeah. Anyone else would like to make a comment or, or ask a question? Jill, I read somewhere that um, I think the oldest bank in the world is a CNE's bank that still exists. Yes. It, it, does, does, with all the, did, was Siena one of the sort of first places to have banking and did it, and, and clearly the amount of wealth would point to the fact that banking would certainly not necessarily start in Siena but would really take off in Siena? Both Florence, Florence particularly because you have the families like the Bardi and the Peruzzi who were bankers and merchants and this is when you get the, the double register of, of, you know, of banking at the time which transformed um, sort of the, the economy. And exactly as you say, um, it's the, the Banco di Paschi di Siena, that's right, isn't it, Sandra, I think? Yes. And great. they still, it's really wonderful because they still sponsor art exhibitions and create beautiful books. And they would be part of this, follow the, the money that I was talking about before. The, bank, the bankers and the banking families were some of the most important. I think the, the Ptolemy and the families in Siena, and they were part of the, the magnets who had these huge towers and got into trouble because um, they, they were really taking over and um, there was very little democracy. So that they, they were um, boosted from the government at the time, weren't they? I understand that those particular families, um, the nobility were not allowed to have a great say in um, in, in the city and the governing of the city because um, what changes there was corruption and all sorts 
So, um, but the banks, yes, you're absolutely right. The banks were fundamental to the success and the production of these works of art. So, yes. So it was uh, fascinating when you showed the pilgrimage route and what an adventure that must have been to come from somewhere like London or Canterbury, mm. travel all through Europe, you know, through France and then into Italy. And um, it kind of reminded me of another event you did, Sandra, about the pilgrims in Venice. Yes, that's right. It was last year. Uh, around this time, it was uh, Sandra Toffolo talking yeah. about pilgrimage mm -hmm. from Venice. From, yes, indeed. Yeah. Well, when, when you kind of think of a sort of leisure pursuits, if, if you think of, um, you know, Chaucer and the, the Canterbury Tales, it was, it was just fun to go on a pilgrimage as well. It was the only time that you could almost justify going away on, on a holiday. Um, it was hard work, but it was still you were away from home and, and you know, you could justify that. And it was it was exciting for people to go and they would have their little pilgrims medals that they would take with them or that, they, that they would take back. And anybody could go on pilgrimage. That's the other thing that it wasn't yeah. you know, any any class, any anybody, any gender. Women could go on pilgrimage. Yeah. Um, no, it, it was an excuse as well to get away. <laughs> it was almost a forerunner of the Grand Tour, wasn't it, of mm. the 17th century? Um, and, and hugely important because it, it developed people's connections with other, with other peoples, with other places as well. Mm. Yeah. And how did they afford it? Well, I think they went, they went as sort of groups, didn't they? I think who it was sponsored by. Um, in that extent, to how they how they were able to do it, I think they would live on the hospitality of the places that they went to, such as um, the, the hospital of um, Santa Maria della Scala. That there would be a lot of charity around at the time. I mean, they wouldn't be living in or travelling in luxury at all, and it would be something that they may only have done once in their lifetime, and that it was a massive adventure. Um, so. Yes, I'm just reading a comment um, that says the Via Francigena was returned to use as a millennium project in Italy. So now you can walk the whole way from mm. Canterbury to Rome again. Yes, which is wonderful. It's something I would have loved to have done. I may never do it now. <laughs> just let's... You never know. No, fabulous <laughs> thing to do. We have to keep positive. If, mm -hmm. if we don't have more questions, I would like to point out to a project that you are involved in at the moment, because Jill is involved, she's the founder and convener of a project called the, the Trinity Network, which is a collaborative project exploring all aspects of the Trinity altarpiece by Hugo van der Goes, the Trinity College a Church and the Hospital in Edinburgh. Can you tell us a little bit more about this before we say Yes, just, just very, very briefly, if I can just share my screen again. Yes, just of course. Second, just to show you the picture so that you kind of know what I'm, what I'm talking about. If it'll work, hang on. And, and the positive point, another, another positive point of this collaborative project is that anyone can follow the seminars, providing they register through Eventbrite. Yeah, you can come back to this. I certainly, I certainly won't go through this, but this is, this is the, one of the works that, um, which is how I got involved in it. But it, it is something that we would love anybody who's got any interest in art and particularly in this work and the Trinity apps, which is the remains of the collegiate church um, of Mary of Gelders where this fabulous work was the altarpiece. And our idea is to revive the Trinity. We want to, it's a, a sort of a research group that's interested in anything relating to the Trinity, this work, the chapel, the hospital, um, we've had a symposium and we've also got a seminar series running at the moment. Um, the next one, for example, is going to look at um, Scottish almshouses and hospitals and the Trinity Hospital, of which very little is known. But if anybody has any interest in it at all, then we would love you to join us. 
and if um, Sandra later puts up the, the slides, this is the Trinity apps, um, there's only a little bit of it left still in Edinburgh, I don't know if anybody knows of it, um, but it was moved when Waverley Station was built, and at the moment it's tucked away just the apps um, on Jeffrey Street, but it's still a fabulous building inside with wonderful vaulted ceilings and, and it and we're working on the music as well that used to be played there. So if anybody's interested, um, these are some of the portraits that I've been working with. But please do join us and I can send the details to Sandra and the links, or we could send you recordings or you could join the seminars, it's all free. And um, we want feedback and we want people to help us with our research. So if anybody's interested, we would love you to join us. So thank you. Thank you, Jill. This is, this is fantastic. And am I correct in thinking that the next seminar you are hosting is going to be next Wednesday? Yes, yep, that's going to be on Mary of Gelders and her art and architecture by Dr. Rachel Delman of, of York University. Um, but if I if I send the link to you, Sandra, if you could that will be, um, yes, send that it, will send be it around and, and everybody would be extremely welcome if they want to join us. Excellent, wonderful. Yes, we will certainly do that. If you can stop sharing a moment, I want to just to yeah, say a couple of things before we say goodbye and remind everyone of our next our next event. Well, thank you again, Jill. You know, it has been an amazing presentation, an amazing uh, evening. So we hope to, to see you again soon, uh, not only at the, at the Trinity Network, but uh, also, you know, in a future event uh, organized by our group. I just want to close uh, by mentioning our next event, which is next Thursday, and that is going to be an Italian event. So we will speak Italian. We are going to have um, a professor, um, Domenico Palumbo, and uh, he will present about Dante's Inferno, and the title is <laughs> All'Inferno ci si va con un amico. Quite right. If I had to go to the Inferno, I would want to go with a friend. <laughs> so I hope that you will join us then next Thursday, 25th of November at half past seven. If you want to support our group, if you enjoy our events um, uh, and you are a member or not a member, but you want to make a small donation to help us uh, going on and continue to deliver our events, please feel free to do so. Um, have a look at our website for all the information, aberdeenitaliancircle.org slash program or slash uh, forward donations as the case may be. Thank you very much everyone and good night. See you next week. Good night. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>